After Vince McMahon purchased WCW in 2001, there was a giant gap left in the wrestling market. Sure, other promotions existed, but there was nothing substantial and there wouldn't be anything substantial for quite a few years. TV networks, who were once very keen to have wrestling on their channels, were now dubious about airing wrestling shows due to the sheer dominance of Vince McMahon in the WWE. When you really think about it, any wrestling show that got put on TV would instantly be perceived as second rate. The WWE had the big stars, the big production values, and their incredible ratings during the tail end of the Monday Night Wars made the WWE look untouchable, and they were untouchable for a period of time. No matter what you may think of the company nowadays and how they produce TV, World Wrestling Entertainment in 2001 and beyond was a money-making machine that no one could rival, at least back then. On the episode of Raw that featured the WCW Nitro simulcast, Vince McMahon publicly fired Jeff Jarrett. Double J had been a WWE employee a few times during his career, but during his last stint, he held the company up for more money in order to drop the Intercontinental belt to China. Basically, Jeff's contract expired while he still had the belt, and so he demanded a large sum of money in order to drop the title. With Jeff's relationship with Vince McMahon obviously destroyed, McMahon joked on TV about about Jeff Jarrett now being unemployed after the WCW purchase. It's funny how things work out because Jeff Jarrett, along with his father Jerry, would end up forming a new wrestling company that would eventually contend with the WWE. Granted, it wasn't a massive challenge for Vince McMahon, at least in the very early days, but Jeff Jarrett and his father came up with an idea to begin a new wrestling organization soon after the WCW purchase and had Vince McMahon retain Jarrett's services after the buyout, they then things could have been very different. Nonetheless, the two Jarrett's and journalist Bob Ryder got funding in 2002 to begin a new wrestling company. Knowing that it would be difficult to get a television deal right off the bat, this new company would air weekly pay-per-views, an unprecedented move that also carried a lot of risk. Being a pay-per-view exclusive show though meant that this new wrestling company wouldn't be held back by a network in terms of edgier content. The Jarrett's were pretty much free to do what they wanted within reason. Vince Russo was brought in before the first show and Russo says that he was the one who came up with the company name, TNA, Total Non-Stop Action, an obvious double entendre that really does sound like a Vince Russo creation. While not a fully fledged member organisation, TNA would partner with the National Wrestling Alliance and TNA would be given creative control over the NWA World Heavyweight title and the NWA World Tag Team Championships. Officially, the company was known as NWA TNA. The NWA association lasted until 2004. But with all the pieces in place, NWA TNA held their first weekly pay-per-view on June 19, 2002 from the Von Braun Civic Center in Huntsville, Alabama, although the show would eventually move to the Tennessee State Fairgrounds venue, which would later get nicknamed the TNA Asylum. So in today's video, we're going to look at TNA's very first broadcast on pay-per-view television. As a heads up, I'm going to try and avoid looking at each match move for move. I want to focus more on the production of the show, the tone that was trying to be established, the roster, things like that. We will of course talk about the booked matches, but it's the whole concept that's way more interesting here. The show kicks off immediately showing us the arena and entranceway, and yeah, it looks good. It reminds me of a lower budget late 2002 WCW show, but this isn't a knock at all. The arena still looks unique in its own way. I should mention too that one of the top ropes broke off during a dark match minutes before the show went live, so the schedule had to be changed around to allow some non-wrestling segments begin the show in order to fix the rope. So the first NWA TNA didn't start with any non stop action, it was quite the opposite. Before we look at the first segment, we get introduced to our announced team. Don West comes out first telling fans that history is going to be made on this very evening. Don West is still with TNA to this very day and in 2002, West made up for his lack of wrestling knowledge with his sheer enthusiasm. Ed Ferrara is then introduced as our next commentator. Ed makes sure to tell the fans at home that he's all about TNA and he doesn't mean total non-stop action. 
So good job burying the company within the first two minutes of the show. Ferrara sends it down to the commentary desk where we see Iron Mike Tanay on the headset. Tanay done some excellent work in WCW and I've always enjoyed listening to Mike's commentary. So having him as the TNA play-by-play -play guy was a great move in my opinion. Tanay says that while TNA will be making history tonight, the company will also be respecting history. Names like Dory Funk Jr., Harley Race and Ricky Steamboat, legends of the NWA will be in attendance tonight. Tanay also says that a new NWA heavyweight champion will get crowned on this very show and he runs down the rules for the gauntlet for the gold main event. Basically a battle royal where the last two competitors would compete in a match for the NWA title. We get sent over to Jeremy Borash in the ring who looks like a member of NSYNC or the Backstreet Boys and Jeremy introduces us to some NWA legends who come to the ring one by one. First we have Harley Race. We have Dory Funk Jr., there's Jackie Fargo, Bullet Bob Armstrong, Corsica Joe and Sarah Lee, NWA Vice President Bill Behrens, and finally we have Ricky the Dragon Steamboat carrying the NWA title to the ring. Steamboat talks about the importance of the NWA Championship and how the NWA belt is the most important and sought after title in all of professional wrestling. Steamboat says the 20 superstars have been hand selected by the NWA representatives in the ring to compete in the gauntlet for the gold match. Steamboat then announces that he'll be the special referee for the final match. And then Jeff Jarrett makes an appearance. Jeff, for whatever reason, says the idea of a battle royal for the NWA title sucks. Jackie Fargo decides to put Jeff into the battle royal as the number one entrant. And then Ken Shamrock shows up, getting a great ovation in the process. You know, this is when it gets strange. Ken Shamrock also says that the battle royal idea sucks. I mean, why are they out there burying their main event? Even though Shamrock doesn't like the battle royal idea, Shamrock says he's the 19th entrant and he looks forward to winning the championship. Another interruption follows and this time it's Scott Hall. The audience goes insane for the bad guy. I also want to mention that Scott Hall's TNA theme was so good. It's a rip off of his Razor Ramon theme which was a rip off of the Eagles song Those Shoes and if you haven't heard Marvelous Me by Dale Oliver then go give it a listen. After delivering his Hey Yo catchphrase Scott Hall also says that the battle royal sucks. Three TNA main eventers coming out and saying the main event is a bad idea. It's insane. And yes, maybe the idea wasn't that good and traditionalists may scoff at a battle royal, but the final two competitors are having a traditional one-on-one -on -one match, so I really don't see the big deal here. Scott says not to worry about the other guys in the battle royal. Scott Hall is the one to watch. Jeff Jarrett says he'll get some payback on Jackie Fargo, and the first segment is over. It was a strange one indeed and it's hard to wrap your head around competitors burying the main event match but anyway let's move on. We go backstage and a lady named Goldilocks tells us that we're going to see some little people in action. For those who don't know, Goldilocks here was a recording artist who provided a lot of theme music for the TNA knockout division and she later became a manager. She interviews Stevie Lee who is calling himself Puppet the Psycho Dwarf. The Psycho Dwarf rambles on about wanting to see, and I quote, some midget blood before Jeff Jarrett distracts everyone by kicking some chairs around. We go back to the arena where we have our first match. We see a lady dancing in a cage before the entrances because, well, just because. And here we have three competitors from the X Division, AJ Styles, Loki, and Jerry Lynn. Mike Tanay explains that the X Division is not a weight class. It's a separate group of wrestlers who class themselves as extreme superstars. Still, this is a very, very capable team here. It can't be overstated how much AJ Styles would mean to TN over the years. Their opponents are the Flying Elvises, Jimmy Yang, Jorge Estrada and Sonny Siaki. The gimmick feels like it came right from the Jim Hurd playbook but let's give the match a chance. Keep in mind that 15 minutes have already passed before the bout begins here. This one actually turns out to be the best match on the entire show and from the get go all six men try to establish what the X Division is going to be about by throwing out a ton of high octane offense. Some call it overly choreographed some 
call it spot fests, but it was different and it was exciting in 2002. AJ Styles immediately shows why he's special in the opening moments of the match. The veteran Jerry Lynn not only hangs in there without any problems at all, but he looks really good in doing so. Jimmy Yang too is also very impressive. And then there's Low Key. His overall attitude and demeanour has gotten Low Key a ton of hate over the years, and it's that kind of hate that isn't good at all. But when Low Key was playing ball and when he was doing his job in the ring, you simply can't overlook how talented he was. We end up getting a good match here and a fine introduction to the X Division. The Elvis gimmick is quickly thrown out the window when the bell rings, thankfully. And really, it's AJ Styles and Low Key who come out looking like the ones to watch. Take nothing away from Estrada and Siaki neither. They too were fun to watch. In the end, Jimmy Yang scores the pinfall win. A good opening match for NWA TNA and a match that had the audience on the edge of their seats. And yes, this kind of bout has been surpassed, but if and when you watch this back, you need to remember that this was in 2002. Jeremy Borash introduces the next bout as a midget match. We have TEO versus Hollywood. TEO, which stands for Total E Outstanding, is introduced as the smallest extreme wrestler in the world, and yeah, it is what it is, really. The first head scissors spot is botched pretty badly, but everything afterwards was pretty much on point. Something that wasn't on point was Ed Ferrara and Don West's commentary during the match. It's every cheap joke they could think of while Mike Tanay is trying to actually introduce these guys to the viewers at home. And yes, it's blatantly obvious that guys like TEO and Hollywood here were presented as an attraction match, but Ferrara and West simply refused to take the match seriously at all, which is a kind of disservice to the competitors in the ring. No matter what their size, they still take the same risks as any other competitor, sometimes they even take more risks. TEO gets the win with a kind of senton elbow drop. The match was around 3 minutes long, nothing more to say. The dancing girls get featured again before our next segment. These ladies would get featured in between each and every segment actually, and it does feel like Vince Russo had his grubby little hands all over this production. Ed Ferrara and Don West are in the ring, and Ed Ferrara can't wait to talk about next week's lingerie battle royal. TNA seem to just love battle royals. And we're going to get a sneak peek tonight as West and Ferrara begin announcing the competitors. They completely mess this up, the timing is all off, women are walking out too early. It's a bit of a mess, but still, there's a few names you'll recognise here, such as Francine, Daphne, Electra, and a young Mickey James. Francine grabs the mic and she talks some smack. She and Electra have a little cat fight. Don West can't stop smiling, and there's nothing else really going on here, though it is quite interesting seeing a very young Mickey James. Okay, follow along here. We have a backstage interview with Mortimer Plumtree, conducted by Goldilocks. Plumtree says that he's the manager of a tag team, a tag team featuring two guys who used to torment him as a kid. Plumtree was able to get a Harvard education later in life, and now he manages the two guys who used to bully him as a kid. These two guys now do whatever Plumtree says. Plumtree even tells his tag team how to dress. We go to the arena and out come the Johnsons. Yes, they're supposed to be, well, two Johnsons. You know, things started off shaky with guys calling the Battle Royal a stupid idea. We got a decent improvement with the six-man tag, but it's at this point where you get a real bad feeling about NWA TNA. Anyway, we have Richard Johnson and Rod Johnson, get it? It's really the Shane Twins, they had a forgettable run in the WWE as the Gemini tag team that was managed by Simon Dean, and that's all I've got. The Johnsons are going to face James Storm and Psychosis, and guess who goes over? You guessed it, the Johnsons pick up the victory. The whole match was filled with more lowbrow humour from Ferrara that gets really old really fast. Any easy joke he can make about the Johnsons makes the air, and again, Mike Tanay is forced to keep things together, but with the action that went on in the ring, it must have been quite difficult to be fair. James Storm is your standout talent here. He had a ton of energy from bell to bell, and he acted like a superstar right from the entrances. Alicia makes an appearance during 
during the bout. Fans may remember Alicia as Ken Shamrock's kayfabe sister in the World Wrestling Federation known as Ryan Shamrock, and others may remember her as Symphony, the valet of the maestro in late 1999 WCW. She stands at ringside and she watches the match. The referee is more distracted by Alicia than anyone else. The match ends with Mortimer Plumtree tripping up James Storm, the Johnsons get the win, and the referee hands over some cash to Alicia after the bout, starting a strange storyline that we'd have to watch develop over the coming weeks. Goldilocks is backstage and she bumps into the Dups, Bowed Up and Stand Up. Bo and Stan have worked in ECW as Jack and Stan. Bo had a cup of coffee in the WWE but it led to nothing, but Stan fared a little better, this of course being Trevor Murdoch. I'm not sure if TNA were overcompensating here and really trying to appeal to a southern audience with all this nonsense, but this was bad. The Dups, who are billed as cousins, enjoyed chewing tobacco, picking their nose, offering their snot as a treat to people. And they also have a girlfriend, Fluffed Up, and yes, she is dating both men. And Fluffed Up was also billed as a cousin of Bo and Stan. Okay, back in the arena we get introduced to NASCAR racer Sterling Marlin. The southern audience cheers for Sterling and they boo when K-Crush, better known as Ron Killings or R-Truth, comes to the ring to interrupt the festivities. K-Crush is sick of hearing about NASCAR drivers and professional wrestling. The guy has a point to be fair. And then things just turn weird. Crush says that his kind are athletes. They throw basketballs, they run for touchdowns, they're the best professional wrestlers while Sterling's kind do nothing but sit behind a wheel and drive around in a circle. Hermie Sadler, another NASCAR driver, and I'm sorry I know absolutely nothing about NASCAR, but Sadler gets the cheap pop by saying that there's a lot of NASCAR fans in attendance. He rips into K-Crush for how he dresses. It's very obvious what TNA were trying to do here, and in today's social landscape, it really hasn't aged too well. Brian Christopher runs in for the save, and a match is booked for next week. Another bad segment comes to an end. We see Jeff Jarrett tormenting Jackie Fargo before we move on to our next match. Christian York and Joey Matthews versus the Dubs. Joey Matthews would be better known as Joey Mercury, and Christian York would continue to have a good run on the independence before returning to TNA in 2012 during the TNA Gut Check tryout program. We get around three and a half minutes of action here. York and Matthews are impressive, and while it's quite difficult to get past the Dubs gimmick, they too work quite well together during this match. It's just too short at around four minutes, and again, it ends due to interference. Fluffed up makes sure York can't jump off the top rope, the Dubs score the pinfall win, and just when you think it can't get any worse, a Toby Keith music video plays. Not only do we see a Toby Keith music video, but he's also in the arena and he's singing a song. The audience in attendance are falling over themselves though, they really love this guy, and they boo like crazy when Jeff Jarrett shows up, pushing Keith out of the way in order to start the 20 man gauntlet for the gold. Okay, so here we go, the main event of TNA's first ever weekly pay-per-view series. It plays out like a Royal Rumble. There's supposed to be 90 seconds between entrants, but that quickly gets thrown out the window. Jeff Jarrett is the number one entrant. Number two is none other than Buff the Stuff Bagwell, and Buff Daddy gets a great ovation from the audience. Jarrett eliminates Buff before the next entrant. He even gets in the ring. The Raging Cajun Lash LaRue comes out next. Double J dominates him before tossing him over the top rope. So Jarrett is getting booked strong here, in his own company, who would have thought it? Screaming Norman Smiley comes out next, the wiggle gets a great pop from the audience, but once again Jared eliminates his opponent without much problem. We have Apollo next. Apollo had made a name for himself in the IWA in Puerto Rico and he actually does well at keeping Jared at bay. K-Crush is our next entrant and for the first time we have more than two competitors in the ring at the same time. Slash comes out next, this is Wolfie D from PG-13. Yes, that PG-13. He's also brought to the ring by the sinister minister, James Mitchell. 
Big Papa Pump, Scotty Steiner is our next entrant. Just kidding, it's Del Rios. This was the one and only appearance of Harry Del Rios in TNA and for whatever reason, he was a blatant Scott Steiner ripoff. Justice is our next entrant, better known as Abyss, who currently works for the WWE as a producer. The ring is quickly filling up as Conan makes his way to the ring, K-Dog cleans house and he too gets a great ovation. The quintessential stud muffin Joel Gertner comes out next to introduce Bruce, better known as Al. Alan Funk or Kiwi in WCW, Kiwi comes to the ring with Lenny Lane. The dog-faced gremlin Rick Steiner comes out next, we have got about 10 guys in the ring now and Rick is able to bring the numbers down by eliminating Slash and Justice. Our next entrant is Malice, fans may know him as The Wall in WCW and Malice is able to dominate as soon as he hits the ring, eliminating 5 guys right away including Conan, K-Crush and Rick Steiner. Scott Hall is the next entrant, we have 4 guys in the ring at this point and when Hall hits the outsider's edge on Jared, the crowd goes absolutely crazy. Toby Keith then shows up as an entrant and to his credit he delivered a decent enough suplex on Jeff Jarrett. Keith helps Hall eliminate Jarrett before leaving the ring. Chris Harris comes out next, he was part of WCW during its dying days. The Vampire Warrior then runs into the ring about a minute before his cue. You might remember Vampire Warrior better as Gangrel. Dangerous Devin Storm is out next, also known as Crowbar. We have Steve Carino. And then the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock, makes his entrance as the ring fills up again with superstars. Our final entrant is Brian Christopher. And Grandmaster Saxe is able to eliminate four guys right away. Away, Devin Storm, Vampire Warrior, Carino, and Chris Harris. Shamrock ends up eliminating Brian Christopher, Malice eliminates Scott Hall and Apollo. So we have our final two guys it's Malice versus Ken Shamrock. Ricky Steamboat hits the ring to officiate the match between Shamrock and Malice and I wish I could say they had a 20 minute barn burner but that just wasn't the case. Instead we get around 5 minutes of two guys going through the motions. Malice dominates Shamrock for the first minute or so but Shamrock is able to reverse a choke slam into an arm bar. This spot gets the audience pumped up. Malice doesn't sell the arm afterwards, he just shakes off the pain and he carries on. Shamrock then manages to apply the ankle lock and again this gets a pop but the hold is applied for what seems like an eternity. Malice makes it to the ropes and Steamboat gives Shamrock a 7 count before Ken breaks the hold. A few moments later Ken reverses another choke slam with a belly to belly suplex. 1, 2, 3 we have a new NWA heavyweight champion. Ed Ferrara kills the moment on commentary by making a joke about the Special Olympics that I'm not going to repeat here for obvious reasons and this really sums up the whole NWA TNA experience right here. There's little moments of good stuff here and there's some genuine hope for the company but then they do some silly shit that makes you wonder what on earth were they thinking. Jeff Jarrett argues with Jackie Fargo and Toby Keith at the end of the show. Double J comes out to the arena complaining about the NWA title being decided in a battle royal. Bullet Bob Armstrong takes a great bump over the announce table and Jackie Fargo shows up to book a match for next week. It's Double J against Scott Hall. The show goes off the air with Hall and Jarrett brawling on the entranceway. As mentioned, there was some good stuff here and thankfully TNA would be able to recognise who really had the talent as the months and even years went on. It was the young wrestlers who made the biggest impression here. AJ Styles, Jimmy Yang, Loki, James Storm, even Christian York looked good during his short tag team match. It feels like when it was good, it was good, but when it was bad, it was really bad. NWA TNA were definitely catering to a certain small group of wrestling fans and these wrestlers wrestling fans maybe felt the WWE had left them behind. Even without the dubs tag team, there's a very southern feel to NWA TNA and it's difficult to overlook, but again, thankfully the company would be able to appeal to a wider audience as time went on. The show does reek of Vince Russo, there's bad gimmicks, there's some horrible commentary from Russo's buddy, two out of the five matches had bad finishes, there were women shown at every opportunity, dancing in cages. I don't think 
think the WWE would have been too concerned after watching this first broadcast, but it was definitely a start. The young guys performed well, there were enough old school wrestlers to keep old school fans happy. It's just a shame that the only true standout bout was the opening six man tag match. It gives you a false sense of security too, you think you're in for a good show, but then it all goes downhill. Keep in mind though, it was their first show, you can't be too critical whenever it's the first show. But that was NWA Total Non-Stop Action, their very first weekly pay-per-view show. I'd like to cover more TNA in the future, but it really depends on how well this video does and what you guys want to see. There are a few topics that definitely will get covered in TNA, but if this is something you'd like to see more of, please let me know. As always, thank you very much for watching.